Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jan Hala. I'm vice director for development. And uh, as our rector is abroad, it's my great honor to open this session. We have uh, two guests from CERN. The first lecture will be given by Professor Fabiola Gianotti. She received his PhD in experimental particle physics at the University of Milan. Then she worked at CERN at the colorimetry experiments, especially on, method on project ATLAS. Professor Gianotti has been awarded for her work by the whole range of the international rewards. She is member of many scientific bodies and holder of honoris causa doctorates. Professor Gianotti and the Czech particle physicist community know each other, the group from the Charles University, Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic and the Czech Technical University collaborated with her from the beginning of the ATLAS project in 1993. She visited several times the Czech Republic in October 2012. She has been awarded by the Commemorative Medal of the Faculty of Mathematics and Physics of the Charles University on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the Czech Republic entry to CERN. It is a great honor for me to welcome Professor Gianotti at the Charles University and ask her to deliver a lecture with the title Fundamental Research at CERN. Thank you very much. Thank you, I'm very pleased to be, to be here. I would like to greet the authorities from uh, from the universities and Academy of Sciences and from, from, from the government. And of course, I have many, many colleagues and friends in the, in the audience with whom we have been working for many, many years and uh, at, least, uh, at least 25 years together since the beginning, particularly since the beginning of the Atlas experiment. So since the, since the audience is quite varied, I see several students. Uh, I see people who perhaps know a lot about, uh, about what we do at CERN and some perhaps um, who are new. I thought that I will um, give a general introduction to, to CERN uh, with um, then also a little bit of more um, details about the physics, the physics program. So uh, let, me, let me start by reminding you that CERN is of course a, a, a high level uh, center, is a center of excellence for fundamental uh, research in, in particle physics, but it's much more than, than that. Uh, you know that is the largest uh, laboratory in the world for particle physics, and in general, one of the most, uh, one of the largest centers for uh, research in in the world. From the um, administrative point of view, is an international organization uh, based in Geneva. Uh, it has been created with uh, four main uh, goals in terms of uh, in terms of mission. Mission number one is, of course, research in uh, in fundamental physics, which over the decades has been awarded by, um, recognized by several Nobel Prizes uh, given, awarded to, um, to, to certain staff of people involved in certain activities. You can see here three of them. It's also a place where the, uh, the, the scientific goals uh, require the, uh, the de development of high tech uh, instruments and so cutting edge technologies in several fields and these technologies of course are transferred to society, they are available for free to everybody. Uh, we all know the World Wide Web which was invented at CERN uh, mainly to facilitate the exchange of information among the scientists involved in the, in the project of the lab but then as a change uh, completely transform a society. And there are many other examples like medical application that I will mention later on. CERN is also a place where we um, form, we train and educate uh, people with a huge number of, of uh, initiatives and my colleagues, Dr. Varakale, will, will talk later on on, um, on um, human resources aspects. And CERN is also a fantastic place to foster peaceful collaboration by attracting about 13,000 scientists, mainly physicists, from uh, all over the world, more than 110 uh, different nationalities. 
And actually CERN was founded in 1954 uh, by, uh, by the vision of several illuminated uh, politicians and, and scientists um, and um, 12 European states. And today it counts 22 uh, member states, including the, the Czech Republic, which joined in uh, 1992. So it's 25 years now of the uh, collaboration of the Czech Republic with, with, with CERN. Uh, we also have six uh, associate member states, spanning from Cyprus, Cyprus to India, Pakistan, Serbia, Turkey, and Ukraine. The budget is about 1.1 billion Swiss franc a year, which seems like a, a big number, so I usually translate it in terms of number of cappuccinos, because it's easier to, uh, to, uh, to grasp. So 1.1 billion Swiss franc per year corresponds to uh, one cappuccino on average, one cappuccino per European citizen per year. So if you got your cappuccino this morning, you already wasted your contribution to CERN, your possible contribution to CERN. So the various member states countries contribute to, the, uh, to, this, uh, to this budget in a, uh, in a way proportional to their NNI, net national income. And so the Czech Republic almost contributes 1% to the budget, so typically 10, 10.5 million Swiss francs. And I would like to say that the Czech Republic is always paid on time. So you are among the best, uh, the best contributors. So this budget is used to uh, pay the salaries of the 2,500 staff and other people on the payroll, but actually most of it is used to develop the uh, scientific infrastructure, so the accelerators, the laboratories, the workshops, the instruments that are used by the worldwide community to do uh, physics and to do science at CERN. And this worldwide community of uh, uh, 13,000 users, actually you see, comes from all over the world. So here in blue you have the member state countries, the 22 member states countries. In, uh, in blue you have the, the six associate member state countries. And then in, uh, in other color you have the non-member state um, countries. And you can see that actually the participation of um, uh, scientists from the Czech Republic is quite important. You see you have something like more than 200 scientists coming from, from the Czech Republic, the various universities and institutes of the Academy of Sciences participating in CERN uh, projects out of a total of almost 8,000 scientists from the member states. So this is about 3% of the member state contribution. So you contribute to 1% of the budget, but actually 3% of your scientists benefits from work at CERN. So this is a quite a, a, good, a good situation to, to, to be. You also have, we also have uh, uh, Czech scientists among our uh, staff, fellows, and, and doctoral and technical students. Here you are doing very well for the young generation, so for the fellows, the doctoral and technical students, because your participation in these programs is at the level of 1% or larger, so uh, as much as you contribute to the budget. You are a little bit low, what expected from the staff viewpoint, as we know, is a, is a bit of a historical problem, and we are trying to, to fix it by promoting, in particular, the young generation, and uh, Mrs. Varakale will come back to this in, uh, in her talk. So I would like to stress that these uh, 13,000 physicists from all over the world, in some cases, come from countries that are not the best friend of each other. Countries that are in, uh, in war, uh, countries that do not respect each other, and yet the scientists work at CERN together, uh, animated by the same passion for, 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 for science, for, for, for research and for uh, improving and uh, pushing back the limit of knowledge. And this, uh, I would like to say that in a world where, um, you know, the countries today tend to retrench more and more in their, within their boundaries, having places like CERN where people are very open, tolerant, and uh, respect each other is clearly, is clearly a, a very important added value. So if you look at the, uh, at the age distribution of these uh, of this 13,000 physicists from all over the world, you see that the peak is at 27 years. So uh, most of our, actually, the, the, the peak of the distribution is very, at a very young age. Many of our scientists are uh, PhD students and young postdoc. Uh, more than 50% of the population is before uh, 35, 40 years old. Of course, there is also a long tail, and there are also people still at the age of 90 who still uh, come to CERN uh, every day. But, but uh, most of the population is young. Now, not all of these of the people, or the young people working at CERN, remain in research, in particular in our field. 
some of them leave because they want to leave, they want to do something else in life, some of them leave because the number of positions in research is limited, typically 10 to 20 percent remain in research, the others go to, um, to other fields, in particular to the private sector, industry. And you see here the, the spectrum of uh, industry that is interested in, uh, in uh, young people form in our, uh, in our uh, um, domain. So from computing to finance to uh, engineering, etc. And most of these uh, people, according to statistics and polls that we did recently, consider that the work, they, they are, uh, their education in a certain related activity, in certain project at their institute, but within involvement in certain project, it has been extremely useful to find a nice job. So they are, most of them are satisfied with their present job in the private sector in industry, which indicates that uh, your, you know, the, the CV you have uh, um, again in through, uh, during your years in science is a very good starting point to get a nice job at the level of your talent and the level of your expectation. So this is very good. So because we have so many young people, of course, training and education is a very important part of our of our mission and what we, we do. And we, we, we train people across a large spectrum of ages and profile. We start from high school students and high school teachers. So uh, about 15 years ago, we started a program called Teachers Program, which attracts at CERN every year um, about 1,000 of teachers, high school teachers who come at CERN to receive a complement of education and training, in particular on aspects related on hands-on physics and experiments, and then go back to their countries and, of course, propagate what they learn also to uh, their classes. So since the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the program, about 15 years ago, uh, we have uh, welcomed and trained more than 10,000 teachers. And actually, the Czech Republic is, is doing pretty well with 155 participants to the program. So again, you are at the level of a good fraction, a good fraction of, 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 of them. Um, we also have schools, of course, for undergraduate students. We have summer students coming every summer spending to spend a couple of um, months, two, three months at CERN. These are undergraduate students. And again, also in this case, the Czech Republic is doing well with um, larger than their quota based on the contribution to the budget. So we are benefiting and profiting from these uh, activities. But also we have schools for uh, young, for, 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 uh, for PhD students in our field, so more specialized schools in accelerator, computing and particle physics, detector for particle physics. And we have schools for postdoc. And these schools initially started in Europe, and then we expanded to uh, Latin America. So since 2011, now we are going every two years to Latin America for, for a certain Latin, Latin America joint school. So this year we have been in, in Mexico just a couple of weeks ago. We go to Asia, and uh, uh, also recently we started to collaborate with the African School of Physics, which is a broader, a broader um, spectrum of, 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 of lectures than just particle physics, but in which we participate in a very important way. And last but not least, CERN receives, uh, welcomes and receives every year about 120,000 visitors, more than 50% of them are actually high school, uh, high school students, and uh, we would like to do more, but unfortunately we are limited, given our resources in terms of infrastructure and people, to this number because we receive three times as much, uh, as many requests that we cannot fully satisfy. So there is a little bit of lining up if you want to come and visit, sir. Okay, so now I go back to the primary mission of uh, CERN. Of course, for the expert in the audience, my colleagues, this is going to be very, very, very simple, but I know that there are people who are not so familiar with particle physics. So let me uh, just stress that what we do uh, at CERN is to study the elementary particles. The elementary particles are those particles that, as far as we know today, cannot be cut into smaller pieces. So we are looking at the fundamental constituents of matters, the matters we are uh, all made of, but also of the universe. And we know that the universe is not all made of the matters we are made of. So we are looking for the fundamental constituents. And this is also, on a personal note, the, the thing that attracted me in into particle physics, the idea that you can really look at the most fundamental constituents of uh, everything. So it's the most elementary of all sciences, if you want. Uh, 
So what are we looking at? Well, you know that matter is made of, um, of atoms. Uh, this is something that everybody knows. And atoms are made of a, a central a nucleus surrounded by a cloud of electrons. And the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons. And protons and neutrons are in turn made of more elementary particles called the quarks. That as far as we know today are elementary, cannot be cut into smaller pieces. So if you want, all matters is made of two types of elementary particles, the quarks and the electrons. And so everything in this room, also this uh, glass of water, if I manage to drink a bit, sorry. This pointer, myself, we are all made of uh, electrons, even you, Rupert. Don't smile because you are also made of electrons and quarks as anybody else. You are not exceptional in, in, in this respect. Okay, so. Electrons and quarks are elementary and are uh, the, the fundamental constituents of matter as we know it today, okay? Now, particle physics at modern accelerators allow us to study matter at the level of the quarks or even below the quarks. So what we do when we use modern powerful accelerators and the Large Hadron Collider that I will introduce in a few slides is the most powerful accelerator ever built by humanity allow us to scrutinize matters at this level. On, a, on, on the physical side, we are talking about 10 to the minus 18 meter or smaller. So one million of a, one billion of a billion of a meter. So very, very small size. So you can see these accelerators as giant microscope that allow you to scrutinize very, very small things, much smaller than the cells that you can, or the molecules that you can, uh, can look at with normal uh, microscopes in the lab. So our microscope, the accelerator, are therefore much bigger. At the same time, this study of the very small allow us to also understand the structure and evolution of the universe, the so-called very big. You all know that the universe had origin about 40 billion years ago from a, a big explosion, the, the Big Bang. Okay, the beginning was very hot and it was a gas of free particles moving at the speed of light. Okay? And then with time, it expanded, it cooled down, and the particle uh, started to get together, got together to find, to uh, form to form the various, uh, the, the, first the nuclei, so the neutrons and the proton, the nuclei, then the atoms, then molecules, and then the lighter um, chemical elements, and then um, so on and so forth, um, the heavier elements in the star, etc., etc., and the planet that we see uh, today. So there are two complementary ways to study the, the universe. One is to use big telescopes, these telescopes which are mainly sensitive to gamma rays, although not only to them. And they, what they do, they observe, they study the, the relatively modern uh, epoch of the universe. So they study the macrostructure, galaxies, stars, supernovae, and all these pulse, uh, pulsars and all these uh, structures that are visible uh, with these uh, with these powerful instruments. On the other hand, accelerator allows us to study the very very early phase of the universe because accelerators allow us for two reasons. First of all, because accelerators allow us to study the elementary particles and the universe at the very beginning was made of elementary particles. So by studying the elementary particles, their interaction, their behavior, we understand what happened in the very early, uh, early instance of the universe. But there's also another reason that uh, until 380,000 years from the birth, from the Big Bang, the universe, the universe was opaque because uh, the, the photons, uh, the light, will scatter uh, uh, um, among the various elementary particles and will be, uh, was trapped essentially in this hot ball. And therefore, this light has never reached us. So li uh, light started to reach, to reach us, and so the telescope, starting uh, after 380,000 years. And so the only way to study the very early universe or the main whale is through accelerator. Of course, you can use other things like neutrinos, uh, telescope, etc. but of course, these are very, very uh, rare events as well. Okay, so how do we do this in practice? So uh, what we do is to uh, accelerate two beams of particles, for instance, two beams of protons, as we do at the Large Hadron Collider, using accelerators. Accelerators are usually a um, collection of uh, electric and magnetic field in an underground ring. So this is a view of the Large Hadron Collider, as I mentioned, the most powerful accelerator. And these blue uh, tubes, this blue structure, contains uh, superconducting magnets that are used to, uh, to, drive the, uh, to drive the beams. So when the two beams 
collide, it's, these two beams are brought at the highest possible energy, which is determined by the technology of your accelerator, the most advanced the technology, and the, the bigger also the accelerator, the higher the energy, they are brought to collision. And in this collision, we are able on one end to understand how the protons are made, so to, store, to, start, to, to study the quarks and the gluons who brings, uh, keep and uh, bind these quarks together, but also to produce new heavy particles because the energy of the collision can, be, can transform itself into new particles. You remember Einstein equation equal mc squared, so you produce energy and the energy can become matter. So this is the way how we discovered the X boson. The X boson has been produced at the LHC, observed at the LHC for the first time because only the LHC had enough energy compared to the previous accelerator to produce the Higgs boson with a sufficiently high rate. In order to study the, the product of, the, uh, of this collision, we surround the collision point with what we call particle detectors. These are uh, giant, um, giant instruments that cover almost the full solid angle around the collision point and are made of subsystems, subdetectors of different technology from silicon to scintillator, crystals, etc. And their goal and their scope is to measure ideally every single particle that is produced in the collision. Measure means reconstructing the trajectory, identifying the particle, measuring the, the energy, etc. And therefore take a full picture of the collision event. So if the accelerators are a kind of giant microscope, the particle detectors can be assimilated, are similar to giant digital camera who takes pictures of the collision between the two beams. However, they have to be very fast because at the LHC, the two beams of protons collide 40 million times a second. So it's clearly a very, very, a very, very high rate which has required the development of very uh, advanced technologies. So uh, let me introduce now the Large Hadron Collider, which started operation in 2010, opening the, a new energy regime and an exploration of a new domain of, of, of physics. So first of all, you can see here the, uh, the region where we, the, uh, the Large Hadron Collider is located. So these are the, the Alps. Italy is on the other side of the, of the, of the Alps. This is France. This, uh, uh, this uh, um, dash white uh, line, shows the, uh, the border between Switzerland here and France. This is Geneva Airport. Here you can see, you can perceive the uh, CERN's headquarters where the main offices and building administration uh, sit. And this yellow ring uh, indicates the uh, location of the Large Hadron Collider. It's a 27 kilometer underground ring not visible on the surface, 100 meter underground. So the ring is just to guide, to, to, to show you the location of, of the ring. Um, it has required, as I will mention later on, a, a, a jump in the concept and in the technology. It was not just the evolution of previous accelerator. It has really required new concepts, new ideas, new technologies in, uh, in the accelerator and in the detectors. And it has also required the community to take some risks because when you, of course, when you explore new technologies, you are always, of course, taking risks because it's not something traditional that people know. And so Rupert and my colleagues here, Rupert Leiden, know, know very well that we had to go through also difficult phases. It was not uh, always smooth sailing. The first ideas for the Large Hadron Collider were discussed, I think, uh, in a workshop in Lausanne in 84. But then the construction of the R&D for the detector started in the early 90s. And this is where our collaboration in, in Atlas uh, started. So the two beams, so in 2010, we started uh, the operation of the, of the Large Hadron Collider. It means that for the first, first time, two high energy proton beams have been accelerated in the two opposite director, direction, and then brought into collision in four points of the accelerator where four big particle detectors experiments had been installed in the underground cavern. And the, um, and the name are Atlas. Uh, ALICE, LHCB, and CMS. ATLAS and CMS are so-called general purpose experiments. They are uh, detectors that are very versatile, very flexible, and can principally discover any type of new particles. LHCB and ALICE are more dedicated to some specific studies. And, uh, and the Czech group, groups from the Czech uh, University and the Academy of Sciences are involved in ATLAS and ALICE, and in two smaller experiments that are not shown here which are called totem and uh, medal. So 
couple of years after um, switching on the, the collider, um, so on 4th of July 2012, Atlas and CMS reported the discovery of, this, uh, of the Higgs boson, which is a very, very uh, special particle which had been uh, looked for for almost 20, 20 years. And I already stress the uh, important contribution, crucial contribution of, uh, of the Czech Republic to, in particular, to Alice and Atlas. So this discovery in 2012 uh, led to the Nobel Prize to uh, two, uh, two theorists, theoretical physicists, Peter Hicks and Francois Angler, who in the early 60s had pre postulated, predicted the existence of the, of the Higgs boson. Since then, since 1964, this particle had been looked for at various accelerators all over the world, and it was only discovered at the RHC in 2012. And here you can see the main uh, results that we publish in our discovery paper. So when we publish the, 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 uh, the papers uh, discussing and describing the discovery of the Higgs boson, you can see here the signal of the Higgs boson. Very often people ask me, how does the, what does the uh, uh, X boson look like? And for us, for us physicists in the experiment, this is the X boson. So here, for instance, from the CFS experiment, you can see the reconstructed spectrum of photons. So what, what, what we, we did, we took all the, the, all the events containing two photons, and we look at their energy spectrum. Now, the X boson is expected to disintegrate itself immediately once it's produced, decays immediately into two photons. So if, you, if there is a particle with a well-defined mass that decays into two photons, then you, you expect to see on top of a smooth spectrum a peak at the mass of that particle. And here you can see clearly the peak, and if you subtract the background, you see clearly clearly a very sharp peak, and this is the X boson. And likewise, the X boson can decay in what we call leptons, electrons and muons. And again, if you look at the events containing four leptons and their mass, you see a clear peak here, and this is um, the Higgs boson. And since then, of course, our understanding of this in particle has improved very much. In the motivation of the uh, Swedish Academy of Science for the Nobel Prize award to um, François Angler and, and Peter Hicks, the Atlas and CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider are explicitly mentioned. So this was a great time. So let me spend a couple of slides to share with you uh, the challenges of this, of this project. So here you can see a spectacular view of the underground tunnel of the LHC. It's 27 kilometers, pretty much similar to what you see here. It's quite boring after a couple of kilometers you have seen, uh, you've seen it all, but it's nice to go, to go, to go down. So the single, the, single most, uh, the single most important ingredient that allowed us to make a jump in energy compared to previous accelerator like the Tevatron Collider at, uh, at Fermilab uh, near, near Chicago, uh, was the development of um, 1232 and the construction of 1232 uh, high technology, new technology superconducting magnets which are, which are uh, um, um, hosted, which are contained in these blue uh, tubes. We need very high magnets to keep uh, the very high energy proton beam inside the uh, trajectory, inside the ring, and to bring them into collision. And if you need very, very high uh, magnetic field, then you need high current. And high currents can only be achieved with superconducting materials. However, superconducting materials become superconducting at very low temperature. And so the, uh, the LHC, which is based on a material called niobium titanium, as a superconductor, operates at 1.9 Kelvin, which means minus 271 degree Celsius, which makes actually the LHC perhaps the coldest place in the universe because the average temperature of the universe of outside space today is 3 Kelvin and the LHC is operated at 1.9 Kelvin. Equally, equally uh, impressive are the, the detectors. Is a view of, Vatl of Atlas, so which is the biggest of the four uh, detectors, perhaps the biggest um, detectors ever built for accelerator um, uh, experiments. Here you can see a human being of normal size, and you can see how big is the, is the Atlas. Here you see enormous, uh, these are coils producing uh, a, a central uh, field in, uh, in the central toroid. The size is about half Notre Dame. You can also see in the background uh, the, the, what we call the, the Atlas calorimeter. This is an object that is used to measure the energy of particles like electrons and photons for the electromagnetic calorimeter and neutron, protons, pions for the hadron calorimeter. And this blue, uh, this blue part which surrounds the, uh, the, the central cryos, that is actually 
the tile calorimeter, which has been built with a strong participation of the, um, of the Czech group, in particular Rupert uh, Leitner and his team have been very much involved in it. Okay, so just mention another, another little detail that we at the LHC, we are really uh, among the, uh, the, the largest consumers of big data in the world because every year we wrote something, we write something like 50 petabyte of data. We have in total 600 petabyte of storage space uh, in our computing infrastructure, which uh, extends all over the world. It's, of course, uh, um, LCG computing uh, grid, and there is also one um, computing center here in, in, in Prague. And so we actually write uh, and, and, and process more data than uh, YouTube, Twitter, etc. So we are considered to be among the, um, the largest consumers. So clearly the question is why did we um, embark in such a, a, a difficult uh, adventure? So uh, the LHC was originally uh, conceived and built to address some, uh, some outstanding questions in fundamental physics. One question was related to the origin of the masses of the elementary particles, the electrons and quarks that I mentioned before, and many more, and many more. Uh, this question is now, uh, well, in large part, solved with the discovery of the Higgs boson, which explains a large part of the, of the problem. So we can consider it to be, in large part, ticked off. However, there are many others that we are addressing at the moment that are still pending. One is the, the composition of dark matter. You know that 25% of the universe is made of a form of matter that is not the same as we are made. It's not atoms and or uh, nuclei as we, are, uh, as we are used to. Um, it's a form of matter that, uh, you know, is there, we know it's there, it's six, it's six times more um, abundant than the, 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 the normal matter, ordinary matter, but, but we don't know what its composition is. And so one of, of the, of the goals, uh, not only of the Large Hadron Collider, but many scientific projects in, in, uh, in the world, is to really detect or produce the dark matter particle, the constituents of dark matter. And the LHC, uh, high energy accelerator, are one of the possibility to produce and observe this dark matter particle if it has a certain number of properties. If its properties are completely different from what we expect at the LHC, then th there are other ways of detecting it. Um, we have also to understand why there is so little antimatter in the universe. The universe today is mainly made of, uh, of matter. The antimatter has disappeared. Of course, um, of course, it can be produced artificially. We do it at CERN uh, almost every day. Um, groups from the from the Czech University participate in uh, one of the ant antimatter experiment by just sending uh, some protons on a target. But in the universe, antimatter does not exist. You have to produce it artificially, and we don't understand why, and so on and so forth. I will not discuss the role of the Higgs boson in detail. I will be happy, of course, to, um, to answer questions. And um, I will just, uh, just two or three more slides. I would like to tell you that since the discovery of the Higgs boson, there has been uh, great progress. The LHC made a jump in energy, almost a factor of 1.7 or so. We are now running what we call 13 TV compared to 8 TV, which was the energy we used uh, at the time we had them at the time of the discovery of the Higgs boson, very close to design. The luminosity also, which is a parameter related to the intensity of the two beams, is already beyond, uh, beyond design. And last year, the LHC delivered to Atlas and CMS much more uh, amount of data, what we call integrated luminosity. You see, this is the amount of data delivered to uh, Atlas and CMS as a function of time during the year. You see the previous year, and you see how much more data uh, the experiments received in 2016, and you can compare with what was the expectation at the beginning of the year and the goal at the beginning of the year, and you see that the collider actually overperformed, made much, 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 um, perform much better than expected. And this data now will be um, used for a great, for a large spectrum of, um, of physics goal. One is to measure the properties of the Higgs boson with more precision. The Higgs boson has been discovered only five years ago or so, four, 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 years, uh, four and a half years ago. So it's not as well known as the other particles. It's also a very special particle, so knowing exactly how it behaves is very, very important. But also, this data will be used to search for new physics, possible new physics that can explain 
phenomena like dark matter, the disappearance of antimatters, and so on and so forth. But CERN is not only the Large Hadron Collider. So uh, this slide summarizes the, um, the three pillars of the CERN scientific activity, which um, proceed along these three main lines. Clearly, the Large Hadron Collider is our priority. No one in the world is operating such a high energy accelerator. The so-called energy frontier, which had moved to the US after the war is now back in, uh, in Europe, and we are very proud, very proud of it. DHC will go uh, through uh, se several steps of upgrade in the coming year to increase the intensity of the two beams in order to be able to perform our, uh, achieve our physics goal with much more um, power. But we also have a um, scientific program uh, addressing other, uh, other scientific uh, topics. I will, go, I will come back to the next slides. And third line of activities, we are already preparing for the future. So we are pushing R&D, research and development, on new uh, technology, superconducting magnets of new generation, new way of accelerating a particle, like so-called plasma wake field acceleration, in order to be able to reach the highest possible energy with the most compact and, uh, co and the least expensive, say, uh, accelerator. And we are doing uh, design studies for future, for future accelerator. So um, one slide to show the, the breadth of the, of the of CERN scientific program. Here you can see the Large Hadron Collider, of which I already spoke and said what the goals are. But CERN is not just the Large Hadron Collider. CERN has a very complex and very rich um, chain of accelerators because you don't accelerate the protons in just one, just one step, but there are several steps in the chain where you gradually accelerate the protons before injecting them into the large hadron collider, and then in the collider you get through the, the final ramp up to the final energy. So, but this, this pre-accelerator, some of which are very old, were built actually in the, in the, in the late 70s, in addition to functioning as uh, injectors and pre-accelerator stage to the LHC, also have their scientific life because they provide beams of different energy, different types, different intensities, different time structure, which are used by a large variety of facilities to do very interesting studies. So we, we have, for instance, we have the only antimatter facility, dedicated antimatter facility in the world, where we produce antimatter particles, antiprotons, anti-hydrogen, um, atoms of anti-hydrogen, and so on and so forth, and actually, uh, the Czech Republic is involved in that. We have uh, ex experiments, we have a neutrino platform where we develop detectors for a program, uh, study of neutrinos, which is taking uh, place in the US. And we have experiments doing precision measurements in order to, you know, to look for deviation from what you expect from theory and uh, through this precision measurement detect new physics and so on and so forth. You see here a long list and in red you can see projects in which the Czech groups are, in, are, are, are involved, and you see also here the breadth of their uh, participation. So one uh, final uh, slide, a question that I'm uh, very often uh, asked is if the Higgs boson will change our life, and uh, my, my, uh, my answer usually t is that it did already, because in order to discover the Higgs boson, we had to develop cutting edge technologies in various domains. Uh, from accelerators to detectors to computing, big data, uh, different instruments. And these this technologies are now applied in other fields of society. So one uh, typical example is particle accelerators. So today in the world there are above, about 30,000 accelerators. Only a handful or two handful of them are used in fundamental research like the, the LHC. All the others are used for practical application, material science, etc. in particular medical application because you can bombard, for instance, the uh, tumors, um, tumoral tissues by using protons or light ions. And this uh, has the advantage of being a much more focused um, radiation than the usual uh, X-rays that, that you use in radiation therapy and therefore be less detrimental to the surrounding uh, healthy tissue. And some of our uh, instruments, detector instruments like crystal color, uh, crystals uh, uh, technologies have been used for uh, um, scanners and uh, like the PET scanners. One word on the Czech Republic and CERN. As I mentioned before, you joined in 1992, and in 1993, you became an independent, separate state from Slovakia. 
You are today strongly involved in Atlas, Alice, and two smaller but not less important LHC experiments, sorry. Um, you have been very much involved in development of inno innovative technologies for these detectors. You are very strong also in, in computing. You have an important um, center we call tier two in our, in our jargon here. And as I mentioned before, you are also involved in a large variety of experiments which cover different uh, scientific goals. So thank you very much for your contribution. And I hope that many of the young people here will join in the future. Thank you. <laughs> you are not going to ask me about the top quark, I hope. You have always list of the supersymmetric particles I remember when you were young, when you were younger. And yes. uh, how, what now, how we prospect that? What is the really chance or probability that we may see some? It's, it's very difficult. So, uh, Vlada Simak actually um, refers to a class of theory called theories called supersymmetric theories that have tried to, uh, un, uh, to answer uh, some of the open questions. And one of the open questions is dark matter. So, supersymmetric theory have in their prediction a, a particle that is actually compatible with the features of dark matter as we observe it through uh, cosmological observation, etc. And supersymmetry was, is also able to address other problems, addressed in a satisfactory way at the theory level, other problems that I did not mention because of uh, will be technically a bit uh, complicated or too much time consuming. So now for almost 20, 30 years, even the time of lab, 30 years, um, people both, the theory, the theory community and the experimental community thought that supersymmetry would be, you know, the answer to the question. So the theory that describe everything. It's also a very beautiful theory. So we experimentalists have been looking for particles predicted by this theory, so-called supersymmetric particles now for 30 years. And we found nothing. So there are two possibilities. Either these particles are too heavy, are very heavy, and so that's why we haven't observed them. So there is the hope that by accumulating more data, the LHC for the moment has only produced 2% of the total amount of data. By producing more data, we are able to observe them because they are heavy, so they are produced rarely, and with more data, we have increased the chance to observe them. Or it could be due, due, due to the fact that supersymmetry is simply wrong. So I can't tell what are the chances. Of course, the, uh, the more you explore the energy frontier with the LHC and, uh, and, and you don't see anything, the, the less confidence into supersymmetry you, know, you have, of course, and other uh, theories. So this is in the hands of nature. I think the correct attitude is not to run behind the specific theories because we are, you know, theories are developed by, by, by physicists, we are clever, uh, you, you, humanity is clever, but nature is clever, is more clever than humanity. And uh, what we develop as a theory, uh, as uh, beautiful as it can be, may not be the truth. So I think what we are doing in the experiments, uh, we are trying to address the question and not just focus too much on a theory because the theory could be simply wrong. So I don't know, we will continue to explore this uh, high energy scale being open as we have been doing uh, over the past years. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have a time <coughs> for another question. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation because I think that uh, especially for the uh, environment of university, it is quite not only interesting but important because it is the physics is uh, probably minor part of the disciplines on the university. But uh, nevertheless, thank you very much. Uh, my very short and relatively simple question is connected with the acceleration and the acceleration of uh, ions and electrons. Uh, the new method is connected with the new method for acceleration is connected with the development of the very intense uh, sources of lights on the petawatt intensities uh, when the lasers are real.
applies in this intensity and it's planned to use it for the real acceleration of electrons and, uh, and ions. Uh, do you have some plans in this uh, issue and, uh, on, uh, for the, yeah, for the thank future? Yeah, the question. Once yes. it is very important for right. For, for so uh, right. So there are different uh, um, different technologies for uh, uh, improving and for uh, the acceleration methods for um, all kind of particles, electrons, protons, ions are being developed are being developed in uh, all over the world. Um, in particular, one of the technologies that we are developing at CERN is has to do with uh, plasma wake field acceleration. I think you, you, you allude to, this, to that when you mention laser acceleration. So, um, however, at CERN we don't we 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 we, we, we are studying plasma wake field acceleration using as a driver not lasers but proton beams. The reason being that uh, um, the uniqueness of CERN is that we have high energy and high intensity proton beams available. So we extract the proton beam from the SPS, and then we use the proton beam as the, as the driver beam to excite the plasma and to create this high energy electromagnetic field, and then to use this field to accelerate an electron beam. So we try to be complementary to other efforts in the world, but it's true that there are other laboratories in Europe and in the US who are, on the other hand, uh, developing the same techniques of acceleration uh, along the plasma cells, the plasma is an ionized um, gas, uh, um, by exciting the plasma through uh, lasers. We are doing it, but with proton beams. So there's a time for the last question. Over there. How, how realistic is the <coughs> accelerator uh, with uh, collisions, electrons, protons in next future? Yeah, so there are, of course, uh, there are, of course, people who are interested in, uh, in um, uh, developing, uh, in uh, colliding electrons, uh, which could be, for instance, produced in a so-called um, little ERL, electron recovery LINAC, and then inject them on the, on the, um, on the proton beam in the LHC and, and, and achieve electron-proton collision. There is, a, there is a project called LHEC, uh, large Hadron Electron Collider being developed at the level of design studies for this uh, purpose. Um, it's not the project that got the, 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 the highest priority from the previous uh, uh, strategy of the European uh, community. You know that every six, seven years, Europe, the European community of particle physics get together to develop a roadmap for the years to come. So in 2013, we had the previous strategy an electron-proton uh, uh, collider was not classified as the highest priority. Nevertheless, there are some studies, and these studies will give input to, to the next update of the strategy, which will take place in 2019-2020. Okay, so we will see the input, and based also on what we know about physics and what we want to do in the future, we will judge it. In the US, there are several, there is intention to build an electron ion collider. There are two laboratories, JLab and, and, and Brookhaven, who are working on this project. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And that's it. There is a good, there is a great tradition that the important guests are asked to write something to our
Ladies and gentlemen, the second lecture will be given by Dr. Charlotte Lindenberg Varakaube. She gained her PhD in the, in <coughs> at the University of Cambridge. And uh, <coughs> Dr. Charlotte Varakaube has been asked by CERN, uh, director, Professor Gianotti, to serve as the director of CERN for international relations. Uh, it's a great pleasure to me to ask she to, uh, to give a lecture. Thank you very much for, for the kind introduction and for the, for the honor of being able to speak to you. It's always quite daunting to follow the Director General and I'm not sure necessarily that I can live up to, to the wow factor, but she spoke very eloquently of the contribution of Czech scientists and engineers to the work of CERN and how important that has been over the years. And to some extent I follow up on that by giving a little bit of an overview, and I will be quite brief because I know that time is running, about the opportunities, for, particularly for the young people. I'm very encouraged to see so many young people here, what the opportunities are in human resources to work with and at CERN so that we can continue to benefit from the great talent and the competencies of the Czech Republic as we go forward. And obviously, as a historian, I'm particularly pleased to be in a, in a historical place like this where we can connect the great past of the Czech Republic with the great future and the future of CERN and the Czech Republic combined. So I hope you will bear with me as I go through what may seem a little bit technical, but I think which is really at the essence of what we do because it is human beings who are behind the results at CERN and without the talent of the Czech Republic, we cannot do it and we cannot necessarily go forward. So I hope you will continue to be part of that effort. So this is all about learning and working at CERN at different levels, from undergraduate to graduate and PhD level and to staff uh, level. Now, there are two categories here that are interesting. That's the employed members of personnel, which is what we have on the left side of the screen, staff members and fellows. But I will really focus a lot on what's on the right side of the screen, which is what we call the talent pipeline. This is where we get young people in to train at CERN, and this is where we build the talent of the future that can eventually become staff members and be part of the effort through that particular, um, particular track. And we really want to be able to continue to build that talent pipeline with you. As you can see, I think the Director General already mentioned that the Czech Republic provides 0.94% of CERN's budget. We do not quite have that return in terms of staff, but we would like to bring that up and part of this effort today is also to enlighten more about the opportunities at CERN and tell you how you can contribute to that. We have currently eight staff, uh, eight, 11 fellows, two doctoral students and two technical students. Importantly, just as the Director General mentioned, we have over 200 Czech scientists. This is a very, very impressive number for a relatively small country in the, in the broader context of CERN. This really shows something about the tradition that there is for particle physics and for fundamental research in the Czech Republic. Importantly here, while we may not have the staff numbers that we would like, we would like to bring those numbers up, we have a very healthy talent pipeline. We see more young people applying and we want to continue to encourage those numbers to go up. We have relatively stable numbers of applicants, about 0.5% of the applications. We would like to see that number go up. Uh, the Czech uh, applicants that do apply actually have a relatively high rate of success and it means that we get very high quality applications from the Czech Republic and we want to continue that. There's room for further improvement here. I want to just mention that we have a special year this year. We have a larger number than usual in terms of staff posts coming up. We have just been allowed by the CERN Council to advertise 80 additional staff posts because we're going into a period of upgrades uh, so there will be a lot of work happening at CERN where we need more manpower to be able to deliver the scientific program. So there are great opportunities coming up this year, but also the next and the coming year after that. So this is a good opportunity to look out for those opportunities. We are very interested in the evolution of applicants. This is looking at the fellows, the associates and the students. Um, and there we see a very healthy talent pipeline. As you can see, we have gone up to, for example, for the fellows, we have 11 
applications now for 2017. This is up from, from seven, several years ago. So clearly the trend is very positive. We want to encourage and consolidate that trend. And I'm looking specifically to the young people in the audience to see that this is really where there are opportunities for you, but not just in physics, also in engineering, in computing, and even in administration, in other fields that may not necessarily seem obviously connected with CERN. There are actually great opportunities for learning. Uh, we have a big outreach event coming up on the 29th of March here in the Czech Republic at the Technical University. I hope many will take the opportunity to learn more about the opportunities at CERN. We will have our talent acquisition group coming to speak more to young people. So I hope you can come and I hope you can encourage others to come on the 29th of March. And this is part of a concerted effort to reach out to the Czech Republic to see how we can work together to get more Czech talent to take part at CERN. I will just very briefly touch on some of the categories of the types of opportunities that there are, which may not necessarily be obvious when you come from outside. And I will start with the technical student program. This is a very exciting undergraduate program. We have about 200 positions every year in applied physics, in engineering, in computing. This is a length between four and 12 months, so it can be a great supplement to undergraduate studies. Um, applicants must have completed at least 18 months of studies, and they are then placed within a technical project at CERN where they work with a CERN supervisor, and they get a living allowance as well as, as health insurance, so there's an opportunity to live in what is not necessarily the cheapest area of Europe, in Geneva. This goes through a committee, so there's a selection twice a year, in June and in December, and it's worthwhile looking out for those opportunities. The admin student program I want to really highlight because this is a, an area of our work that may not necessarily be as well known as when it comes to the physics and the engineering and even the computing, but as the Director General mentioned, we're an intergovernmental organization. That means that there's a lot of running of a big uh, machinery which gives opportunities in, in things like translation, human resources, in business administration, in finance, in budgeting. We have a library, science communication. I oversee everything that's education, communications, and outreach, and we have a very rich program in terms of communicating on science. So there are great opportunities for doing um, outreach work that goes beyond just the, the, the physics, if you will. And this is a, a little known program where we would like to attract more talent because it enriches us to get that talent on board. It's the same conditions as the technical student program. So four to 12 months, there's a CERN supervisor, 18 months of undergraduate study is required. So it's a great supplement to undergraduate studies. And again, living allowances. It also goes through a committee, June, December, so it's just worthwhile keeping a lookout for those deadlines. The doctoral student program, I think the Director General already mentioned how many doctoral students are on site. Some of them are paid by CERN. These are the, the 60 positions that we have a year. Obviously, many, many more PhDs come doctoral students that are linked to their home universities and are paid from their home universities. So these are particular posts where the big proportion of the funding will come from CERN. This is in applied physics, engineering, and computing. You will see this comes up again and again and again. It's very important for us to reach out and to make it known that there are opportunities in the physics area, but also engineering and computing. The Director General very, very nicely mentioned in terms of the 50 petabyte of, of data that we produce every year. The, the IT component of our work is extremely important. So this is a doctoral uh, fellowship program with between six months and three years. Uh, it's a technical project leading to a PhD thesis, which is obviously given by the Home Institute. CERN does not handout is not a university, so does not deliver the degree, but obviously the work that is done at CERN is, a, is part of, is effectively the degree. And again, a living allowance and health insurance which allows students to work and live in the Geneva area. Committees in June and December, a very important part of our work is exactly the committee work that there's an equal, uh, the equal opportunities for everybody, there's a level playing field, so there's a very rigorous selection process but that also means that every candidate is given due attention and it's not a question of necessarily having a particular network, it's a question of applying and people get assessed on the basis of merit and that is a key parameter for us. If we look at the students by discipline, you can see for the doctoral students, applied physics is the largest group, but there are also 
big groups in computing, electronics, and mechanics. And for the technical students, it is computing and engineering that dominate. So you can see that the three pillars of our work are really well represented across the student population, and we want to continue that. The summer student program is a flagship program for us. Many of the colleagues I work with today have started as summer students, and they have a lifelong bond with the students they have started with. We have about 200 coming from member states every year in a summer program that's between eight and 13 weeks, physics, engineering, computing, again. And this is a combination of a high level, very high quality lecture program with lectures by Nobel laureates and others, visits, workshops, and then being embedded in, the, uh, in what CERN does. And there's accommodation on site, and it's an extremely lively and interesting program. This is where we get into the graduate area. It's necessary to be either in the final part of a bachelor's or the beginning of a master's, but it's a fantastic opportunity for those who really want to build a career in physics or in engineering and computing to come on site for an entire summer and to work with with their peers and in programs at CERN and to really get embedded. And it's, it's a fantastic, it's a great boost for the rest of us also. The summer students are such a great part of the, of the year. And about 6,000 students have already gone through. And as I said, some of the most eminent scientists we have on site today have gone through the summer student program. So it's a well-known training ground for the future generation in all these disciplines. The fellows we mentioned, and this is exactly where the Czech Republic already has a relatively healthy number of applications, but we'd like to see more come in. This is a very important talent pipeline for us. About 250 positions every year. This lasts between two and three years. It is necessary to have a bachelor's, a master's, or a PhD. If you already have a PhD, you come in as a senior fellow, so at a slightly higher level. This is a proper employment contract and you are part of, effectively part of staff when you're there as a, uh, as a fellow. Importantly, it is only a two, three year uh, program, which means that obviously talent is created also to go back, either go back into industry, go back to academia at home. A lot of this is about talent return. It's about creating and forming the talent, not just for the lab, but for the country. Where the, where the talent has come from in the first place. This is part of the return that we give to member states who are paying for the running of the lab. So talent return is very important for us. In addition to that, we are also recipients of uh, Marie Curie fellows that are paid through the European Commission. This is for university graduates, again, in the three, in the three main areas of our work, physics, engineering, computing, up to three years. It's necessary to have a master's or a PhD, uh, and the employment contract is with CERN. CERN adds a little bit on the living allowance to what the commission can provide, but it's a very attractive package, and again, fantastic talent return for the countries in, in question, and again, for all of our posts. There's the added value, in addition to the technical competencies that that young people get with us. It's also the network that they develop, it's the contacts they build, and it's the international context that they suddenly learn to navigate in a different way than they can learn at home. So there's a whole, a whole range of, um, of talents that you get with your home, in addition to the technical competencies, obviously, that are, that are primary here. We have a, an additional program for technical training experience. So this is a slightly different type of opportunity to the more academic-based uh, opportunities. This is for mechanics, electronics, electricity. So this is where you need to have a technical diploma. Uh, this is actually a talent pipeline we would like to develop more as we go forward. Um, there is a panel of specialists that go through the applications. This is usually for one year and then possibly for renewal for another year with a CERN supervisor. So this is a, a technical type of program, but one with, with which we've had a lot of interest and a lot of success uh, in mechanics and electronics and electricity. But also we, for example, have a photographer who's being trained with us in the outreach area. So it's possible to even go into fields that may not necessarily be immediately obvious. And as with all of the others, we have committees in June and December. Now, if we look a little bit at the staff positions, which is where, to some extent, the talent pipeline is going, this is where we try to get young people on site so that we can form them and they can be eligible for staff positions in the longer term. 
Usually we have about 150 on an annual basis. This year we're going up to 200, as I mentioned before, because we're going into a very important period of upgrade um, and, and um, development of the scientific program. So this is where you can have anything from an apprenticeship or a technical diploma to a PhD and be eligible for, this, for a staff position. These are advertised, these are open to the public, this is not a closed uh, system. Uh, you apply via a web-based platform. Usually this is for an initial period of five years on limited duration contracts. It is possible to have uh, indefinite contracts in the longer term, that's a different system. You start with uh, with five years in the first instance, and then these are proper staff posts, and obviously with that comes all the relocation expenses, etc. In addition to that, just to mention, we talked already about the different types of associates that we have. So these are uh, these are scientists and also young people who come on site, but who are employed by their home institutes, either as uh, on a leave of absence, on some sort of sabbatical, who can come to us under different types of associate schemes, but where they keep a link with their home university, they are paid by their home institutes or their universities, um, either as part of a collaboration agreement with CERN or as a standalone arrangement. And that's another opportunity to work with CERN uh, in that context, but in a slightly different type of arrangement. So just to remind, some important deadlines coming up for those that are interested. These are the committee deadlines coming up for the, for the doctoral, technical and admin students, for the technical trainings, for the fellows, etc. All of this is available online. We have a lot of outreach material where it's possible to learn more about the types of opportunities that we have. All of that is available also online in our media corner. We are on most social media platforms, so it's also possible to follow what we have coming up on all these different platforms. We have videos that explain what it's like to work at CERN. It can seem quite abstract and difficult to understand what the different types of jobs entail. So we have a whole raft of videos that explain a little bit more what it's actually like on a daily basis. And I think a lot of them are really quite interestingly done. So just to conclude, there is a great range of options for really high quality training at CERN, learning and working opportunities in a very multicultural environment that gives you skills just beyond the technical. It provides recognized, world-class recognized competencies that can be used in a wide range of fields afterwards and it's really a way for us to equip the next generation of scientists, engineers, technicians with the best possible skills to succeed. So we hope very much that many of you will be part of that. We hope that the faculty here will help us spread the, spread the word about this so we can continue to feed that talent pipeline and we can continue really to benefit from the talent and the competencies of the Czech Republic. Thank you. about your partisans, scientists, scientists more. And, uh, I think I need the microphone on this. Sorry. What about your praise for artisans who can propagate just the same science? For artisans who can... Propagate? Artists, ah, oh, now you touch... <laughs> Now you touch a topic very close to my heart, uh, the meeting between arts and science. This is obviously going a little bit beyond what I was asked to talk about, which was human resources, but we have a very rich and very interesting arts at CERN program uh, through which we actually embed, we embed artists, it's an artist in residence program at CERN, where artists from all across the world can actually apply to be embedded at CERN for a month, a couple of months, and then they're paired up with a scientist. And in that kind of collaborative collision, if you will, between arts and science, the artist really gets inspired and then will go back to the country or the institute or wherever he came from or she came from and will create art based on how they were inspired by science. And we have seen an absolute explosion of interest in this program. We hope very much that we can continue to develop it. It is not part of our core program, so it's something where we must raise funds on the side to be able to allow the program to continue because obviously our main, 
Our main purpose is fundamental research, but we like very much and are very interested in this creating meeting between different fields. And we think in a world that's um, where all the challenges we face cut across, it's very important that different disciplines talk to each other, that they inspire each other, that they enrich each other. So arts at CERN and having artists on site is actually something that we're very interested in. So if you have anybody in mind, let me know. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Dámy a pánové, děkuji vám za vaši účast a dnešní sezení končím.